What is up, guys? Well, welcome to another episode of Guarani Vision, the first ever podcast dedicated to Paraguay football in English. As always, I'm Roberto Rojas, and joining me are my two great co-hosts, Federico Perez and Ralph Hanna. And here we are once again. We are wrapping the Abid Roja, as we always do, because it is World Cup qualifiers time. Obviously, it is the week of World Cup qualifiers again for Paraguay as they look to continue to strive to qualify for the 2026 World Cup happening in North America. But it's a bit different since the last time we spoke. The last time we spoke about the World Cup qualifiers was back in November. It was with a different coach, a different team. But there is that still same level of optimism, pessimism. It's a mix of all emotions, basically, as obviously Paraguay will kick things off against Uruguay this Friday under new manager, Gustavo Alfaro. can't believe how many times I've said new manager ever since this podcast started. Um, but any case, here we are once again, obviously we're talking about what to look forward to into these games against Uruguay and against Brazil next week at the Defensores del Chaco. So I don't know where to start. I might as well go to Fede because obviously he's the man on the ground. He's the man that is in the same country as all these players from abroad. Literally, the majority of them abroad have made the trip to Paraguay. You've only had two exceptions of the players that play in Paraguay that we'll talk about momentarily. But yeah, here we are. It's it's Tuesday, the day of recording. So we're three days away from the game against Uruguay in Montevideo at the Centenario. Just want to know what you're feeling, man, because I think it's almost as if, though, it's Groundhog Day again for Paraguay. You know, the same old, same old, but we don't want the same result to happen this time around. Hi, Roberto. Hi, Rob. Here we are again. What an evasion. Back at it. Back with the Amiroja. We're never taking this shirt off no matter what, right, guys? I mean, it's it's it looks harder than ever, right? I mean, we're not that excited, to be honest. I don't think, you know, the hype has... You you can't feel the hype here in, in the streets. Uh, obviously, the first game will be played in Uruguay, in Montevideo. So we, we got to wait for that second game next week against Brazil. Uh, I think that a lot of people will... We'll have to wait for that first game to really see if they show up in Defensor del Chaco for that second match, even though Brazil itself is very attractive with Vinicius coming in uh, and and them not doing too well lately, right? So we might even have a chance there. I don't know. I, I'm trying to hang on to something. Your wife's going to miss about five, six players uh, about uh, after what happened in, in, in the Copa America. And yes, we're back with the new coach. I mean... The good thing is that we got two new games ahead of us. We it's it's time to forget totally about the Copa America. It's time to talk about Gustavo Alfaro and his new list of players, the new faces because there are a couple of new faces on this list. Uh, I'm uh, I'm sure they're very excited to to give something to their national team and chip in in this very hard time. And obviously, I'm imagining, I'm already thinking about what what's the strategy going to look like against Uruguay, against Brazil. So definitely want to talk about all of that, Roberto, with you and Ralph. Yeah, Ralph as well. I mean, you know, I think certainly in this stage of the qualifiers, I think it's it's almost as if, you know, we can't fall short yet again. You know, we've, we've had this with Paraguay during this point of the season of, of the qualifiers where, you know, it, it almost as if though we're kind of losing that belief every time that one string of results could end an entire campaign. Cause you know, we are at a crucial point, you know, these games in September, October, November, that's 12 games out out of an 18 game uh, qualifying process. So really by the end of this year, Paraguay better be in a position to at least put themselves into qualification or at least the playoff spot. And, and more so now with the majority of the teams that are going from South America to the world cup automatically, you know, you, you you can't fail here. This this is really the the crucial last roll of the dice that Robert Harrison and the APF are really going for. Is this oh it's it's now or never, or we'll have to wait another four years, but with no qualifiers this time around. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think like you say, it's this crucial coming into this crucial time, these six games for, throughout the rest of the year, and that's pretty much why they had to get rid of Daniel Garnero because. They realized going into this crucial time, they didn't have the right man for the job. And they, the team hadn't responded with that historically poor Copa America showing where they got zero points. So I think that's partly why we've seen the change. And then the real pressure for Gustavo Alfaro is he has no time to get ready. He, um, <clears throat> excuse me, he only arrived back in Paraguay since his press conference, like he left the country. He only got back in on Sunday, right? For the first training. The players are still arriving as we record today on, on Tuesday. Like the captain, Fabian Balbuena, has only just arrived from Russia. Literally, like as we record, he was in the airport. So 
he has very little time to work with the players and he has to get it right straight off. So that's kind of some of the pressure that you're talking about. And even the way the games are structured, Paraguay play on Friday, but Bolivia play at home on Thursday. So if Bolivia win, they will take Paraguay's spot in that final kind of playoff spot. So going into the match against Uruguay, it's, it's very probable that Paraguay are actually not in the World Cup spots. So it makes it even kind of even more pressure and, and what they're really looking to do is, is try and improve on the direct rivals, which I think are going to be Ecuador and Venezuela, right? They need to try and build more points in those two to, to have a chance. And that's, that's, I'm sure, really where Gustavo Alfaro is focusing. Because he even said in his first press conference, right, this is all about, like, getting points, getting points. Not getting wins, getting points. And so that also gives us an indication when we start to talk about his style of what we might expect to see. Yeah, and, and obviously looking at some of the players that he's chosen, it's certainly gotten, I would say for the start, it's kind of given some easel, easy plaudits, I would say. And we'll, we'll start off real quick, just looking at the team at itself. We look at the goalkeepers. We obviously have Carlos Coronel, who's kind of been part of that process of the World Cup qualifiers so far. We have Juan Espinola uh, of Belgrano. And also one name that is returning to the main squad, who actually performed at the Olympics, is Gatito Fernandez, Roberto Junior Fernandez. So I don't know where to start with this one, guys. And I'll go to Ralph on this one. This is a really a curious case because we saw in this qualifying process alone, well, not even that, just in the last year, we have saw <laughs> Paraguay use Carlos Coronel. But then when the Copa America happened, Garnero switched it up to um, Rodrigo Monínigo, who obviously that was his first ever, that was his three, he played the entire Copa America the three games, he's not called up in this one. So where do you feel as if, though, we're probably going to see it? Again, we're going to have to wait and see, but I just don't know if it's going, if Alfaro's going to go back to the confidence of what we saw from Gatito from the Olympics, because, you know, he he did say that he watched Paraguay during the Olympics, so maybe he's basing on that, of being the goalkeeper that is going to start these games. Is it going to be back to Coronel? like we saw in the first round of qualifiers, or does he just change it up and say, hey, I'm going to go for a speed on So I don't know where to, <laughs> who's even going to be the starting goalkeeper in this case. This is the, probably the hardest one out of all of it, really. Yes, it's been a problem since Anthony Silva retired, but even before that, because Anthony Silva probably wasn't at the level Paraguay needed, but he was the best goalkeeper they had, right? But even as he was getting older, some of the reflexes were going, you could tell it wasn't the same same standard, but they just had nobody else. And so they they had to nationalize one goalkeeper in Carlos Coronel. They've, they've looked at this young goalkeeper in Mourinho, which was really a very Garnero decision, I would say. I mean, that was a big surprise that he, he took him, having played so few senior games. And so now you have, I think it's probably between Coronel, who has some experience already playing in World Cup qualifiers, or Gatito, who, like you said, played the Olympics. The thing about Fernandez is that he... He had some bad moments in the in the Olympics, if you remember some errors, and and those are the errors he never he never managed to improve on in his career. Like like claiming high balls, there's always been he's always been a bit difficult. He's a great shot stopper, so I don't know. This is a really tough one to to start with, and I think, but I think this speaks to the areas where Paraguay are weakest, and we're starting at the back going forward. And as we go through this chat, right it gets better and better the quality but this is really one of those positions where where they're not they don't really have anybody who deserves to be a starter or was like a an expected number one see this is the first reason why Alfaro is going to get paid millions of dollars and why we don't get any of that money guys because he needs to make the hard decisions on this situation and this is probably the first one I mean, when you look at the, at the team and you're going to build it up, you, you see that Roberto Fernandez, yeah, he had a pretty good uh, 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 Olympic Games. He, he had a couple of games where he stood out, but uh, he, he's no guarantee. He doesn't have the character to be the, the, the goalkeeper for his national team. He's been there before and he couldn't keep the spot. Uh, he doesn't convince me. The same thing I'm going to say about uh, Carlos Coronel. I mean, he's shown so far that he's an average goalkeeper. Uh, but but not more than that. And in the national team, I, I think you need to look be beyond that, and you really need a leader back there, especially when 
when when you're getting so many goals, uh, when you're getting hit so many times, you need a, a, a goalkeeper that has the character to to get up from those situations. And I was kind of happy that they were finally looking into the young goalkeepers. And you know, even even as we're talking about Roberto Fernandez, I'm thinking about Ángel González, who got injured right before the Olympics. I mean, maybe if he would have been the starting goalkeeper during the Olympics, he would have gotten a chance now because Alfaro clearly was looking. At the Olympics, as a reference, uh, looking into making this list also. And that's why he took into consideration Roberto Fernandez. Because if we look at his current state where he's playing at his club, he's not uh, playing, guys. I mean, he's the sub. He, he barely, he hasn't played, I believe, a single game after the, the Olympics. And Juan Espinola, he's getting his opportunity because he left Olympia where he wasn't getting any game time. And he went to Belgrano where ever since he has uh, moved, he has started and he has been playing. So I actually wouldn't be surprised if the, the, the situation comes more down to uh, Carlos Coronel and Juan Espinola because they are the goalkeepers that have been playing. But hey, it, I, I think it's totally open, Roberto. I wouldn't be surprised if any of the three uh, start in the first game against Uruguay. Yeah, I mean, Ralph, if you, if you want to go, and, and, and I agree, I, I think it's open, really. I think this is certainly, I don't recall the case of a goalkeeper having or at least in a situation where a goalkeeper position has been so open like I think the Monidigo one was very weird in the sense that of Garnero trusting his Libertad guys Coronel I, I get that was from Gustavo sorry Guillermo Barros Queloto so that's going way back even then so yeah this is a new manager and I'm, I'm sure he's seen clips and videos and you know the analysis that he gets from his from his coaching staff of what goalkeeper works in what position but Rob, I mean, I got to tell you, there's not, and I have to agree with Fede, I don't think there's one goalkeeper out there that stands like, yes, this is the guy I want because he's he's confident enough to be the starter. But out of all what we've seen from in the last year or so, there really isn't one that just stands out more than anyone. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's why we're in this position, right? Because these of these three players is not a particular one. I mean, I think... Looking at what Alfaro has been doing so far and the one he's going to end up picking is probably not necessarily the best goalkeeper in terms of quality. It's going to be more of that leader, motivational figure that he can see. And so then you have an interesting question as well because, of course, uh, Coronel doesn't speak Spanish as his first language. Uh, Gatito, as we've said, kind of he went as one of the more experienced players to the Olympics, but this is totally different and he's never really been that, that kind of motivational keeper. And then you have Espinola, who will have played with some of these guys in Olympia. Like, he's at Belgrano now, that's true. But he's never been at, let's say, the, a big club. And so he's going to have to be talking to European-based players and, and trying to get them up for the game. So, I mean, <laughs> between the three, it's quite hard. I don't know. If I was to pick, I'd probably end up with Coronel just because he's played the qualifiers before. Um, so that's maybe you have at least that base. I don't think I'd want to go with Gatito because of what we're talking about. So, yeah, maybe Espinola could be the the one in there, but but I think he'll probably end up with Coronel. Yeah, I'm, I'm leaning towards Coronel, actually, Fede. I mean, if you, do you feel that the same way, like at the end of the day, this time, this time Friday, that he becomes the starter? Yeah, I think the thing, the same thing that you guys are are focusing on. I think he's gonna end up picking Coronel, but if I was up to choose, I would try out his Pinola just because I think he's been waiting for this opportunity. He's finally playing, and since nobody has convinced me so far, let's look for a new one. It's gonna be interesting, and and now moving towards the defense, I think this one is a bit more clear cut in a sense. But I think obviously, in looking at some of the names that we got here, obviously a lot of familiar names actually. Uh, from the cycle, from the Copa America, from way back. We have obviously Gustavo Gomez back on the team, Junior Alonso, Fabian Banduena, Omar Lerete, Gustavo Velasquez. All those players were at the Copa America. Some new names as well. We see Blas Riveros back to the side. We see also Juan Cáceres, Juan Cáceres of Lanús, the nationalized player. He's back into the side. Mateo Gamara is also on this side. We were supposed to get Santiago Arzamendia, but due to an injury that happened, I think yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, he gets replaced with Daniel Rivas, who played in the Olympics as the left back. I think when you look at it really, and I want to go to to Fede first on this one, I think when you look at it from a from a clear-cut position, I, I think this has always been one of the important aspects of Paraguay, and more so with Gustavo Alfaro being the manager that knows how to manage defensive sides. I think he's always been a manager that is 
very defensive and loves to play on the counter. I think similar to the style that Barrow likes to play. So this is really the area of the of the team that he's going to be really focused on. Really, he's going to pinpoint his ideas towards it. I think the one starter for sure is going to be Omar Lerete because I think he brings that experience of playing in Europe. You know, he's he's obviously been doing so well at, at Getafe and he's been in Europe for quite some time. But then you look at the other positions. You would say that maybe Gustavo Gomez goes back in the team, but he hasn't been. He didn't play the Copa America. It was Fabio Malbuena that took that spot. Do you take him out? And even in the fullback position, you know, you obviously have a, a reasonable debate. You would say for the right back with maybe Casades, maybe Velasquez. Um, the left back position has also been interesting. Do you put Blas Rivero, someone who's kind of performed somewhat decently for Paraguay, but hasn't really flashed? Or do you give the chance to Rivas? Do you give the chance after what you saw in the Olympics? I mean, you know, I think the only player that I feel is safe in this back four, if we're going to say it's going to be a back four, is Omar Alderete. And I think the rest of the positions, it's open for everyone. It's very interesting what you said also, because I, I was looking at what Costa Rica did during the Copa America. And just like Raf is saying uh, in our chat, I mean, he played against Brazil, at least with five in the back. So... I don't know if he's going to go that way again, you know, and tell his team, hey, guys, let's try before anything, before we even get a shot at goal, let's think of ours. Let's think of ours being on zero at the end of the game, you know. Let's try to have that clean sheet, which is something that that's clearly something that's always on Alfaro's mind, I mean, in every team that he's managed so far. So uh, I ob obviously think there is going to be a defensive setup in both games just because we're facing very good teams, teams that have, a lot of European players. And just like you said, in defense, right now, Paraguay only has Omar Alderete playing in Europe. The rest of the, of the defense, yeah, you have a couple of players playing in Russia, Fabian Balbuena, you had Junior Alonso, who was just playing in, in, in Russia. He's coming back to Brazil now. Uh, and I'm mentioning Junior Alonso because this is somebody that Alfaro already had under his wings back in, in, in Boca Junior. So you're always thinking that when a coach comes, he, he might trust players that had he already had, especially with when, when Ralph mentioned you have very little practices, you have very short time with them. So maybe Junior Alonso, somebody that wasn't getting them much minutes lately with the national team, might get another opportunity, just like Gustavo Gomez. I think it's really open back then. There. And especially if we if we are going to go with a, a, a line of five uh, defenders, I mean, it, it really totally opens up the game. You 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 might end up with Balbuena, with Gomez, and with Alderete, which is something totally new. We have never seen that before. Or the opportunity that we saw that was with Alderete playing with a with a line of four defenders and, and him being a left back. I I, uh, I don't see that happening now just because of the kind of players that he chose by the sides he, he was thinking about Arsamendi and and he brought in Rivas which is somebody that also likes to attack but he kind of showed that balance in the Olympics he might actually break through and have an opportunity because of Arsamendi uh, being down and we really don't know how well Blas, uh, Blas Riveros is right now he hasn't played that much in his club I don't know how what shape he's in you know I don't know how much Alfaro is going to take in this situation because he did uh, put in this list a lot of players that are not playing in their clubs, Ralph. So uh, this kind of leaves me, uh, you know, I don't know what he's going to do with all these players because he wants to see them. He wants to have them up close in this first call up. I do think there's a lot of that, you know, I'm calling you up. I'm going to test you out. Let's see how you do out there because I don't have that much time to prepare you for it. So I, I think there's going to be a lot of that in this, these two games, a, a big tryout for most of these players. Yeah, and firstly, looking at Alfaro in terms of whether he plays a back four or a back five, I mean, if you look, he did he did start out with a back four with, with Ecuador, but pretty quickly he switched to the back five because he needed the points. And so we're in that same position right now. Then you look how he went to the World Cup. I was just looking over, for example, the game against uh, Netherlands, which was probably Ecuador's best game, I think, in the World Cup. They were, they were unlucky not to win. He did the same thing, right? Played the played the back five and you think about Bielsa and Van Gaal and, and you think about that pressing is probably a similar, well, as similar as we can get, I think from, from recent experience. So, so I really do think he'll, he will line up with five defenders. It also solves him quite a good problem. His problem is 
he he probably wants Balbuena and Gomez, but he can't leave out Alderete because Alderete isn't the best player. But Balbuena was the captain. Gomez has traditionally been the captain. Definitely wants him in the team. I think from the whole motivation psychological standpoint. So this is a way to get Balbuena, Gomez, and Alderete together, a bit like Fede was saying. So so I kind of feel that will end up being the back three. But Junior Alonso is like Junior Alonso is a really interesting question because. Do we see Alonso even at left back where he started his career? And that would be an ultra defensive team. But you never know, right? Because of talking about trusting players. I think from what I've heard is, by the way, Blas Riveros hasn't been playing much. And he's just, he's not looking, he's looking like he could be injured too. I mean, when Asamendia showed up, everyone realized quite quickly he was injured. And so he was, he was left out. Um, but I think Riveros could be in a similar position. So, so Rivas really has a great chance of starting this game, which is a nice turnaround for him as, as even a player that maybe not necessarily was going to be the number one starter in the Olympics because Cantero is a very good left back as well. So, so that's really nice for him. And on the right, you kind of assume it's going to be Cáceres based on him getting the call up again. And if you do play that line of, that line of three central defenders, you don't really want Velasquez as well because that would be basically another central defender. I don't think you need Velasquez if you're going to play with the, the line of five. So I think we might end up seeing the Cáceres and Rivas as the fullbacks and then that Balbuena, Gómez, Alderete. But I'm I'm pretty convinced he'll go for a back five. It's it's probably the way necessary to go, Fed, especially when you deal with this kind of game uh, with Uruguay, with Bielsa, and even when you take on Brazil of Dorival. I think that might be the way to go. So certainly, Feather, this is these are the players that he's going to have to rely on the most if they're able to snatch points out of both these games. I actually think it's a good idea to be to have a coach that's this flexible, right? And uh, he's thinking about the strategy. He's thinking about the team that he's going to have to face up against. Because as, as of right now, you don't have a strong team. You, you don't have a team that's already built up. You got to build that team. So uh, I, I think this is something that Alfaro also likes, that he has a lot of players that he can choose out of. And he can really build a different uh, setup in the defense. Because we didn't see that uh, from the, our last coaches. I mean, uh, out of the last three that managed this team, all went with the back four pretty much I, I i don't think i ever saw a back five or, or maybe a more defensive setup from the midfield but barely changed that that defense it was always up to gustavo gomez and balbuena junior alonso was always left out and alderete had to wait a long time to get his opportunity and finally win his spot over yeah absolutely i think that's that's the way to really go at it and we'll have to wait and see in these last in these next what, two training sessions, if at all, or more, a little more on the, over that, just to see what team we get. Looking at the midfield, these are the midfielders that were called up. Obviously, you also have a lot of familiar names there, but some new names and some new names that have also been kind of questionable that we'll get to. Uh, looking at the midfield, we got, obviously, the main stars of Miguel Miron on the team. Ramon Sosa, fresh out of his move from into, um, from Talleres to Nottingham Forest. He's on the squad. You obviously have Villasanti, uh Kaku Romero, Andres Cubas is there. Diego Gomez is back. Diego Gomez is back on the senior side after he missed out on the Copa America due to injury. Uh, obviously had done so well at the Olympics as well. He actually also confirmed this week from the player himself that he is going to go to Brighton and Hove Albion in January. So that's another uh, good sign, I guess, of getting more players into the Premier League. Damian Bobadilla, who also was at the Copa America, is back. But there are two new names in this midfield. And I'm going to actually go step by step because I think you have really a yin and yang, an opposite towards it. Let's go to kind of the more positive one. Hugo Cuenca. Hugo Cuenca of Milan Futuro, the Milan reserve team, the player that kind of made that jump from Capietat as a young kid playing on Milan's academy. He gets his first ever call up. He was actually on a couple of days after the call up. He actually got his first call up with Milan, the first team. He didn't play the game against Lazio. In Syria, but you know it shows that the manager Fonseca is giving him the, the uh, the confidence. But hey, this is a really bold move. I'm gonna go to Ralph on this one first. This is a really bold move from Alfaro to get someone like Cuenca, who you know I don't think a lot of Paraguayans have been able to see him unless they have been able to see him like Milan reserve games or or uh, you know he played the preseason for Milan uh, when he came to the United States against teams like Man City, Real Madrid. But this is the first time that a lot of the majority of the Paraguayans will be able to see Hugo Cuenca in the flesh if he gets his chance in any of these two games. Yeah, that's right, because he was at Capiata 
um, here in Paraguay, but but left very young to go to to go to Milan because I think it's it's kind of hits during the, that strange pandemic time when there wasn't much youth football going on and some youth tournaments were cancelled. So that's probably why he didn't play much with Paraguay, the, the youth teams as well, right? Um, there is a question that he got to go to Milan under 18 because he has a Spanish passport. So technically he could play for Spain. So there might be a little idea of using him just for a couple of minutes in the World Cup qualifiers to sort of lock him in with with Paraguay whether he's whether he's really going to be starting is, or, or playing much is is unlikely because now we're talking about an attacking midfielder that's where Paraguay with this this forwards and and attacking players is actually that's where they're the strongest right I mean we're gonna we're gonna talk about all the Premier League base players and and everybody so I don't think particularly like Cuenca will will see much, but he might get some minutes, like I say, to try and to try and lock him in because this is obviously a World Cup qualifier FIFA game. They did something similar with Iturbe um back in the day when Iturbe was was between Argentina and, and Paraguay. So so we might see something like that. Um but if we're just gonna talk about the midfielder, the the two key players, I think really the key players are gonna be Andres Cubas and, and Diego Gomez, right? Because what Paraguay needs is the defensive Stability and Cubas has been the ball winner, and he's he was excellent in the Copa America. I think they they missed him in that that last game that he was he was suspended for. He's got a big job because although Uruguay missing a lot of players through suspension, one that isn't missing is Federico Valverde, who by the way scored his first ever goal against Paraguay. I was in that game in Defensores del Chaco back in 2017 or something. So he um. He's got a big job there, Cubas. And then Gomez is the link, right? That athleticism and that box-to-box. That's what's going to be able to take the ball from one end of the pitch to the other. So there's a, there's kind of, I think, huge pressure on, on those two and what they could do in, in midfield. I'm looking forward to to running into Hugo Cuenca. I remember saw him back in the day, you guys, when he was playing for for Capiatá when when the Copa Paraguay, I believe, was just starting out. He got an opportunity in that club, and ever since then, he he got called up, I believe, to an under 15 a national team, and then he never played again for for his national team. So for him to come back, I believe he just a couple of hours arrived to the country, and you could see that he was. Does that get happen probably to uh, Tony Sanabria, right? I mean, most of his life in Europe and now coming back to his home country and, and, and having the opportunity to put on the national jersey, it must be very special uh, for these kind of guys. And uh, yeah, Tony always gets so much criticism because he's so cold. He has that European kind of style. And he, he, a lot of Paraguayans don't kind of like that situation. I don't know how Hugo Cuenca is going to fit in the locker room in that sense. I mean, he's coming from, from Milan. Uh, and it's going to be very interesting to see him develop, right, as a young player. But if he still has that magic that he had when I saw him when he was young, which is probably the same thing that caught uh, AC Milan's attention just when he was 14, 15 years old, we're, we're in for a special treat, guys. I mean, this might be a very good finding from, from Alfaro. And just like I was telling you guys before, he doesn't care if the player is playing or if he's not playing. He's looking at the quality of the player and what the player might bring for the team. So he's a magical player. He's he's very good. He's very tricky with the ball. And he, I might compare him with the Ramon Sosa. You know, he can make a difference on the one-on-one. And uh, this is a player that we're seeing that he's very young. He has so much ahead of him. So I think this is a very interesting call up. And uh, I don't I don't know if we're going to see him in these two games, but I do think we're going to see him on the long road. And if he called him up now, it's because he saw something in him. It could be that kind of the wild card in in a way of some of these games, like when the game's getting really tight, you could put him in as like a spark club in the next last 10, 15 minutes of a game, and he can really run wild over towards the Uruguayans and Brazilians. So we'll have to see how he looks. But there's one name out there that actually got the most question marks out there. He played in the Olympics. He was mm, somewhat decent. Again, he had a really bad game against Japan where he got sent off. And then I don't think he really found his feet, but he's actually not been on the best of form. Wiener Vieira of Cerro Porteño, his first ever call-up. I mean... Fede, I, I don't get it. He was the only, well, at the time, he was the only um, player that was called up from the local league. Obviously, we saw Danny Rivas getting in, so that's two players. But 
the Wheeler Vieira situation is very weird considering he's not been of the best of forms at Cerro Porteño. Um, he's a, he is a talented player on his on his best of days. We get that. But certainly getting the call up when he's not been on the best of forms is, is a weird case from Alfaro. Probably the weirdest decision he's made so far of his tenure. Yeah, this is a very weird one. Uh, the press is obviously talking about it here in our country. You know, this is the one name that caught everyone's attention, especially because he was the only call up from the from the local leagues. Uh, then we had the injury of, of Arsamendi, like you were mentioning, and Danny Ribos was also called up from Nacional. But I mean, to call up a player that's not always a starter in his club, that was that was something interesting. To call up a player that failed uh, against uh, Japan that had a very bad mistake in that game and mentally, I believe, has not come back ever since. He hasn't been the same player in Cerro Porteño because I, I watch Cerro Porteño's every single game and you can see that he hasn't developed uh, uh, more and he hasn't come back from being from, from that mistake. He barely had a, a time off all, also. So I, I think mentally he's not ready for this opportunity, but Hey, you know, football is like this. I mean, the best thing and that you can get as a player is a new big game ahead of you. And when you get an opportunity like this, you're getting the confidence from the head coach of the national team. I mean, this is, beautiful from the player uh, perspective from the player side of it yeah i mean this is even good for his resume for 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 him to get an opportunity to go somewhere else and play outside of the country because that's what a lot of players want right on their resume to have a couple of games on the national team maybe that's why he's been called up because they want to sell him because they want him on the on on european leagues uh, but you, you, to be called up for the national team, you need to deserve it. And I don't think he's done enough as of right now in this year after what we saw in the Olympics to have that spot. There are a lot of many players in the local league that I believe deserve it. I mean, we have Olympia in the first spot. And if you look at their midfield, uh, I don't know if people are saying call up Richard Ortiz. I think Richard Ortiz time is, is over. Uh, he, can, he can't he can even play 90 minutes. But alongside, alongside him is Alex Franco, a very talented young midfielder that has a tremendous career ahead of him. Why not call him up? I don't know. There's a whole bunch I could throw throw in and throw very different names out there but Wilder has the advantage maybe that he's very young right yeah you're mentioning Marcos Gomez also who, who played a very good Olympics but he's very different from Wilder Vieira I mean Marcos Gomez is more of a defensive kind of midfielder so I, I think it, it, it has to do also with Alfaro once out of these two games uh, from these players but to be honest I'm shocked that just as everybody else Rob I don't know how you took this information I know he's one of your several Bortelia players but come on Wilder Vieira, right now, after what he did against Japan, I wouldn't have called him. Yeah, it was very surprising. I think, I mean, I think the reasons for it is a bit like Fede was saying. There's, there's, he has a style, probably this most similar to Diego Gomez in that he can try and win the ball higher up the pitch. But obviously, no level. He's not close to the quality of, of Diego Gomez and, and definitely not the form at the moment. So I was thinking, I mean, if you wanted a player like that who's playing regularly at a quite high level is Brian Ojeda in, in Salt Lake because Brian Ojeda has been playing a lot of minutes now in MLS. He's, he's very established there. He's totally different to the player that, that couldn't get a game at Nottingham Forest. So I would have thought of somebody along that. One thing that has come to mind uh, or one thing that I've heard is that Gustavo Alfaro's training sessions have been very similar to Facundo Savas. Fagundo Sava in who was at Cerro Porteño. They actually, I think Sava and Alfaro were together in Arsenal in 2008. I need to check that, but as player manager. So there might be something, they might still talk. I don't know. But Sava liked Wilde Vieira a lot, right? That he was, he used him. So I don't know if there's also that, there's some kind of recommendation or Alfaro's thinking about players that did well in that Cerro team, like Damian Boadilla as well, is another one that comes to mind. Um, can I use them because we're going to play a similar style? But but like I said, it is surprising because I think you have better players that can do that job um, outside of, of Paraguay. And like Fede says, if you have to, if maybe there's like a, a bit of local political pressure that you have to at least pick somebody from the local league, then there were definitely better options on the table, especially in, in terms of um, form at the moment. So it was it was a surprise. It was a surprise to see so little uh, local league players, I think. We haven't seen that in a long time. 
but it gives you an, uh, an idea of what Alfaro thinks about the local league. He, he went to all the games, right? He was, at, he was at a whole match week of games, so he's not been impressed. Um, but then when if you are going to have to call up one, I didn't think Will De Vieira will be that one. It's a very weird situation. It really is. I don't know what. I guess maybe he saw something in the Olympics that maybe had convinced him otherwise. But yeah, we'll have to see if he gets that opportunity and more so if he really takes it and, you know, surprises us all. Rounding up the forwards, obviously we get the familiar names, but also some new names too. So this is the one where he's very tasty in a way because you do have a lot of players that are of quality, but it's almost the case of like who goes in. Obviously, it's really spearheaded by Julio and Ciso at Brighton Albion. His first time playing the World Cup qualifiers in this cycle. He missed it out last time around due to injury. He is back on the squad. The reputation is obviously with him there, but he's still quality as what we've seen for quite some time. Adam Barredo is back on the squad as well. He just made that move to River Plate. Alex Arce is on ridiculous form at Liga de Quito, guys. He hasn't been able to get so many chances of being able to flourish himself on the Paraguay national team as a whole, but he's still demonstrating that he can score goals in Ecuador. But we have two names that, you know, one new one and one kind of experienced one. Tony Sanabria is back. He is actually the last goal scorer that Paraguay has had in any game, really, or at least in any um, qualifier game. He was the last guy to score a goal in this qualifier. It was against Bolivia, and that was almost a year ago now. He's back on the team, and it kind of really reinforces to the statement of him saying that every Paraguayan is available for selection. He kind of hinted at that, and there comes Sunny Sanavia. But the big name, Ralph, this is the one that, you know, we're going to finish off here with in terms of the names. He gets his first ever call-up after really going on some good format. Cuyaba, we obviously see him play in the likes of uh, Olimpia. He, he had his time in Spain. He's been playing at Brazil for quite some time. Isidro Pita. Isidro Pita getting his first ever call-up for the Paraguay national team. Another Capiata player, right? Because uh, Peter was a Capiata before he went to Olympia, so similar to <laughs> to to Cuenca in that sense. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting. It was nice to see Peter in there because, like Arce, what he's doing is scoring in Copa Sudamericana, not just in local games. He he's scored a lot of goals for Cuiaba in in the Brasileira, but a lot of penalties. So I think what maybe looking at some of his um performances in Copa Sudamericana when the level's a bit higher, uh similar to the way Arce has been doing well. So I think I think that's that's nice to see those two those two together. Um but the player that you're gonna get is is not them, is not Alan Barreiro, it's gonna be Tony Sanabria because there's no way that Alfaro has done this whole kind of uh, gestion, let's say, to, to get him back into the team, get him back into favor to bring him and then not to play him. He wants Sanabria. The, the whole press conference at the beginning was around Sanabria. You could tell that he was, you know, looking at Harrison. He was saying everybody's uh, uh, welcome, all this kind of stuff. But the, it, it's not everybody. It was, it was one player in particular that he wanted is Tony Sanabria. And the reason I think he wants him and uh, the reason I think he starts ahead of, say, Arce, who's on better goal-scoring form, is that really what he needs is someone that can bring Julio and Ciso into the game because we're not going to have much possession or I would assume we're not going to have much possession. So it's like, who do you have that can then hold the ball up and bring in, well, actually, Julio and Ciso or Diego Gomez? And that's Sanabria is much better in that hold-up play than, than probably... Well, definitely than Arce, probably everybody else. Adam Barreiro is maybe the, the closest, but Barreiro is not playing as much since he went to River Plate. And just that level of quality, having a Serie A striker in there is is what he's looking for. So I really think you're going to see Enciso and um, uh, Enciso and uh, Sanabria playing up front because we've already used our five defenders. I don't think we have space for Sosa, but um, but I think you'll see those two playing together. No space for Sosa. We haven't even mentioned Almiron yet. We haven't even mentioned him out of all the players that could go in. So, again, this is a first ever call up for a lot of these players. You know, a lot of names that we've been familiar of that kind of impressed us, some has disappointed us. So, Fede, for Alfaro's case, he's really, like you said at the beginning, he, he's the one getting paid millions to make these hard decisions, not just at goalkeeper, but at defense, at midfield, at forwards substitutes and trying to keep the group happy and of course have the team play well so yeah there's just a lot going on in these next few days that's really going to have his reputation on the line 
Yeah, he, he chose a, a couple of wild cards here on, on this first list, right? We, we were just talking about Cuenca, and now, now just to mention Pita, I mean, he's going to have to show off that he's ready for this kind of opportunity and to play in the, at this level, right? I mean, this is a player that probably wasn't on the radar if it wasn't for the uh, for the goals that he scored this season. He, he, I think he's been playing regularly. I don't know. I, I've done a couple of his games in Sudamericana. I don't see him in that European level, you know, to play against the big teams, the big defenders. But maybe this is his chance. He's 25 years old. He still has a, a, a great career ahead of him. He might even play in a big team in Brazil. I don't think he's he has a European career ahead of him. I don't think particularly when he left the country. He didn't look like that kind of player, but he left pretty young and he had that opportunity already in Europe. Uh, I think he played in Portugal. Then he and Huesca in Huesca, he played there. Yeah, he played in Huesca exactly. Uh, so yeah, he played he played in Cerro in the in the Cerro Porteño Academy, and then he went to Olympia. So he did play in the big teams in in Paraguay. But I don't know, he's never looked like a like a in, in the way I see it, a national team player. But it's it's an opportunity. I mean that that number nine is always up for grabs. And we don't know if he's going to be Alan Barreto again in another opportunity. If he's going to be Alex Arce again, or if he's really going to go just with Tony Sanabria, who is that European player. And maybe he's that kind of player that he's that he's thinking that can make the difference up there. But we'll see who gets that the, the confidence from our from our head coach. I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing all these kind of players. But it, it, I, there's three names, guys, that I want to see to play together. And I mentioned this before the Copa America, and I'm going to say it again because Diego Gomez got injured right before the Copa America. Is Diego Gomez? Is Julio Enciso? And is Ramon Sosa? If these three guys play both games together. I'm going to be totally happy and I'm going to be right there at the locker room after the game to high five Gustavo Alfaro because this is what we need. We need these three players to start building a relationship in the field. And these are the three players that I believe can make a difference for our team. The rest of the team, build it up. But those three got to be in there. Those three, the way I see it, need to play every single game, every single minute of the game. Well, Ralph, I mean, you you put in a lineup here in the chat, and I'm I'm reading it right here, but I don't see a Sosa in this lineup. What's going on? Well, I can't see, I can't see how if assuming Alfaro plays five at the back, right? How does he fit? He can't fit three forwards because he's not. So he's only going to play two forwards. One Sanabria, one has to be in Ciso. So because I'm thinking in the midfield, he will he will definitely need Cuas and Gomez, and then. Maybe Boadilla, I'm thinking, because he wants to press high. It could be Via Santi. We haven't spoken about him. It could be Will de Vieira, but unlikely. So I can't see where, where Sosa would play, knowing that, that this is how Faro is going to play. Now, there'll be different games, right? When you play against um, Bolivia at home, I don't know. Actually, maybe we already played that one, actually. We already played them. We already played them. Yeah, so. that's a shame. Okay, but let's say we have a game at home where we think we can... Uh, Venezuela. We got Venezuela to play at home soon. So that's, that's an example. Right, let, let's take that one then. Then I think the 5-3-2 becomes more a 3-4-3, right? Then you can be a bit more attacking, and then you can fit Sosa in. By the way, Almiron has no space in this team. I mean, I just can't find I, I can't find a position for him, right? Um, Sosa more so. I mean, yeah, okay. Well, you you could drop, you could actually drop Sanabria. You could end up playing in Ciso, right? And Sosa and just those two flying about and, and being hard to mark. But you just can't find space for, for Almiron. So it's interesting. We're talking about some changes. I think these are the big changes we're going to see. Partly because he will insist on the the line of five, I'm I'm pretty convinced by that. So there's there's just not going to be space for all of these good players that we do have going forward. Yeah, I mean, Feather the, again. The, the, there's just a lot of names out there, but it, it's also the case of like, wait a minute, we've already seen these players perform already in these qualifiers, and a lot of them haven't stepped up. Case in point, Almiron. So him not going, even though he is playing in Europe and has for quite some time. If you're looking at it on form, and more so now that he's not really getting any minutes at Newcastle, but also looking at the form that he really has demonstrated in Paraguay, he hasn't really shown that he could be a starter on this team. Um, I think it would be great to just because of his quality, you could still have him off the bench, you know, similar to what we get from maybe a Cuenca, maybe a Pita, whatever, you know, as kind of like those wild card when the game gets tough and it gets tiresome for a lot of these players, that could be done but not to start off the, the game. That's just the reality we're at at the moment, which I don't know if it's a good problem to have. Uh, maybe just shows up the players that we have, but again, it's got to gotta hit perfectly well like that. 
Yeah, I totally get what Rob is Rob's point. You know, we're we're gonna be a very defensive team probably from the setup at the beginning of the game, but eventually you're gonna have to try to do something in the game. So I, I do hope that you know those three that I mentioned have an opportunity to play together because that's what I believe on the long run is the team that you really need to build. But for these two games, I, I totally get it. You're gonna have to think about having that clear sheet, uh, you know, as your main goal uh, and. As for Almiron, we're we're hearing from his coach on on his club on Newcastle. I mean, they're trying to get that best best version out of him again. You know that player that we saw a couple of years ago. I mean, Almiron has 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 been on on rumors of leaving Newcastle, and I haven't heard that many fans of Newcastle going crazy because they were going to lose Almiron because he hasn't been that star. Uh, for his, for their team lately so as of right now i don't see him having that starting role on this team maybe uh, uh, alfaro wants to give him the confidence wants to give him another opportunity but i'm done with him as of right now i want to see him on the bench i want to see him uh m make the best out of the minutes that he gets on this team and that he earns those minutes when he's out there that he earns the opportunities just like he didn't earn it in the cup america he had very clear opportunities to make the difference he even had opportunities to score and he didn't show up so that's the player i want to see uh come back you know the player that we saw in Atlanta united i barely seen flashes of him in newcastle guys and i don't know if he's going to come back to that player ever again just because of everything that he's been gone going through lately maybe he's relaxed maybe he just feels like you know he, he the best of him is 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 behind him hopefully it's not that way hopefully he has a very good season in the european football but it hasn't started that way for newcastle so i, I that's why i want to see ramon sosa playing that's why i want to see julian c so i want to see the young players mixing it up in 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 the attack roberto and maybe even surprise us alfaro with putting in kaku romero at a certain point you know we talked about junior alonso having the confidence in defense and i remember that hug after the game against costa rica uh kaku was one of the first ones hugging it out there with alfaro he knows him pretty well uh, from his days at huracan so um, kaku who is another player that's always said that no kaku doesn't run he he, he can't have the ball he, he can't be the the player that makes a difference for this team maybe he has another opportunity with a new coach it's going to be a lot of storylines on this game on these two games with a lot on the line and we'll, we'll go out now into our final segment the predictions our favorite ones of course uruguay is first boys it's against in montevideo against the neighbors the the big talking point i guess in this one for uruguay is they will be with a depleted squad so a lot of stars will not be on this team because of the suspensions that Comebol gave them after the fighting that happened against Colombia back in the Copa America semifinals. So, what does that mean? No players on... These, these are the following players that are not on the team. Jose Maria Jimenez, Matias Vina, Matias Oliveira, Ronald Arujo, looking into the midfield. No Rodrigo Bentancur, no De, De Rasqueta, no De La Cruz. The forward line, no Darwin Nunez. So you have a lot of players missing, but that doesn't mean that this Uruguay seat time is this side is not strong. Is not as strong. Uh, sorry, it is the very strong side. Luis Suarez will play his final game for Uruguay on this day. He announced it actually last night that his last game against Paraguay will be his final one wearing La Celeste. So there's also that roaming around. Obviously, they have the quality of players like Federico Valverde, Nate Hernandez. Obviously, they still have a really good defense in that sense even if it's not as strong as you would say having the likes of Jimenez or or uh, Arujo on this side but ultimately it is the toughest test you would say to really go against a Marcelo Bielsa side but how do we see this going on I mean ultimately I think it's going to be one of those really defensive games I think it's going to be probably a boring one as much as Paraguay really want to show off how good they are with their attack I think it's going to be one of those boring games I want to go to Ralph on this one because I, I genuinely see a really boring game in this one and, and maybe that's a positive thing to start off I guess I don't know that's how I feel yeah you're really selling it yeah um, <laughs> yeah I mean Marcelo Vielsa has a great record in in World Cup qualifiers just to start he's won like 83% of World Cup qualifiers he's only ever lost at home twice which was with Chile one time to Paraguay right when Tata Martino was was coach and one time to Brazil which I think is is fair 
But he, he is very, very strong. And even though they're missing a lot of these players, and let's just talk about their big misses, right? Uh, Jose Maria Jimenez was captain. Uh, Darwin Nunez is top scorer in the World Cup qualifiers. You had uh, Betancourt. Is, well, he's been in and out, actually, because of injury. But his last, I think, qualifier was the Bolivia home game. He was really good in that. So, I mean, they're, they're key players that they're missing. Um, that's that's for sure. And and Bielsa has this great record. And then you have Suarez playing his last game, by the way. He's tormented Paraguay in the past. I remember, he scored in the Copa America final. I remember when they beat us 4-0 uh, not so long ago. Or maybe maybe it wasn't long ago, but it seems recent memory. He scored twice in that game, set one up, I think. So, I mean, there's there's just so many things going into, into Uruguay's favor in that sense. But as you pointed to, um, Paraguay is going to have this quite defensive setup with, you know how Bielsa is going to play, which I think helps Alfaro because it's, there's not going to be many surprises from the, the Uruguay side in personnel, maybe, but not in style. And so I think we can set up quite well. And we haven't beaten Uruguay. I think you've got to go back to 2001 in Montevideo with Markarian as coach of Paraguay. So that's such a long time. So I don't think we're going to see Paraguay getting three points. What we might see, and what we have seen quite recently, uh, some nil-nils and some one-ones. We we had a 1-0 loss, I think, which was a Cavani penalty. So we've had really close games recently, and I think we're going to get something like that. And I, I'm kind of hopeful that we can we can shut them out and we can we can get that point, right? Nil-nil. We might get a 1-1 uh, or something of that, but definitely, yeah, low-scoring a low scoring draw. That's what I'm looking at. What do you what are you saying then? Give me you gotta give me a, a score. What do you got? All right, I'll go one one. One one. I'll say nil nil. A really boring game to start out the Alfado era. Fede, what do you say? I'm 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 very optimistic, guys. Um I don't see your why, you know, being too comfortable under the situation of missing five very important players. They do have uh, many good players out there in, in Europe playing, but not that quality, not that kind of quality. Uh they don't have two Darwin Nunez, they, they don't have two Betan Court. Um and and they kind of missed that in the Copa America when they had a couple of players injured in that long run, they couldn't manage their situation. And that's where Bielsa's first plan kind of got out of hand. So I don't know, guys. I mean, I'm looking into shocking the world. And there's a saying in in football, a new coach brings new a new win maybe you know so so i don't know i'm gonna go with that one you know i'm gonna go with the three points i'm gonna say yes after a long long time our father's gonna do it somehow and we're gonna beat your white just by a goal maybe a very very late goal in the game after suffering and i'm i'm hoping that out of these two games this is the one that we win because uh we've already be, been in bielsa in the pre-olimpico this year we saw Bielsa failing, failing very bad in the Copa America. And all, the only thing that everybody remind, remembers out of uh, Uruguay in the Copa America is the fight in the stands. So I don't know, guys. I don't know if they're going to be that comfortable as everybody thinks against us next Friday. I think Paraguay can shock everyone and Paraguay is going to win it. Impressive. Amazing. So who scores that one goal then? I said it's going to be a very late goal, so I think it's going to be somebody coming in, Roberto. I would love it for it to be Ramon Sosa, for it to be Gomez or Enciso, because those are going to be my flags in these two games. But if I'm going to look into somebody coming in, I'm going to say an Adam Barredo. I'm going to say maybe a late sub. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think one of our strikers coming in, maybe a Cuenca shocking everybody. You know, one of the new favorites, uh, one of the new phases, maybe even Pita coming in. I, I see a sub coming in and and being being on the front of, of all the newspapers here on the next day. You're really going at it. I mean, how special would that be? Cuenca scoring the game winner in his first ever game. Uh, to the first ever win against Uruguay in Uruguay, that, twenty three. That's, that's the dream right now. That's the that's the, that's the beauty of the football that we have an, another opportunity and that we can start over with plenty of new faces. That's why I wanted it to go that way, Roberto. Absolutely, that's wow. You're you're really bold in it, Fed. I love it. I love when you're bold. That's a really good claim to have. The next game after that though is against Brazil. This is the heavyweight clash of them all at home. We obviously played Brazil uh, a couple of months ago. Yeah, literally a couple of months ago. Not good memories. They beat us 4-1 on the day. Uh, obviously, that kind of se secured elimination from the Copa America in that one. 
but it's a new coach. Obviously, Brazil really didn't show up in that Copa America. They got eliminated by Uruguay on penalties. You know, they stuck with Dorival Jr., a manager that, when Gustavo Alfaro was managing Costa Rica, got a nil-nil draw with them. So I don't know if we're going to see a similar game in this sense. I don't know. Maybe we do actually, Fede. I want to go to this one because obviously they have some talented players in there. You know, they they obviously have the likes of Vinicius Jr., Rodrigo. Obviously, in the midfield, you have the, the Newcastle players of Bruno Guimaraes taking on Miron. You know, obviously, you get Andre, who just made his move from Fluminense to Wolves. I really like him as a player. Lucas Mora actually called up for the first time in a long time, guys. I think almost, yeah, almost 10 years or so. He's been called up after a good form with San Pablo. You have the young kid, Estival, uh, from Palmeiras, who's going to make the move to Chelsea. Endrick is obviously in there. Um, so there's still a very talented name on names on, like, paper alone. But can they make it work under Dorival is the big question. And we've already seen... Alfaro get his number uh, a couple of months ago at the Copa. So does lightning strike twice again? Do we see, and you know, we haven't beaten Brazil in quite some time. I think the last one that we won was in 2008 in the World Cup qualifiers there. So it's been a while since we've beaten Brazil. Um, and obviously we haven't had the time to play them a lot anyway, but yeah. How, how do you see this? How do you see this game? I like, think this, this is the one everyone is really looking forward to, especially as a player to play against brazil in front of your home crowd yeah and as as a somebody in that as a someone that loves watching football this is one of the big games that i'm looking forward to also watching right i mean just to have vinicius here on on the defensores de chago have players like rodrigo it's, it's going to be very interesting to see them out there even though we do have some, a certain background with a certain vinicius after what he did with our defense in in copa america he should probably use i don't know if you guys remember those shin guards of the 90s that you almost went up to your knees you should probably use those for this game because i do think a couple of our defenders are going to try to go at him uh, after what he did a couple of tricks at us uh but besides that situation, I mean, Brazil is not looking good under the last coaches. I don't think they're going to look good until they get Neymar back. They don't have a star player as of right now. And Vinicius, I believe, is his head is, is in Real Madrid trying to uh, make friends there with Mbappé. Uh, I don't know if he's really into the, the Brazilian locker room if he, or if he's being the leader that the Brazilian team needs. I mean, he should, did show up against Paraguay in the Copa America, but that was it, guys. I mean... After that, I mean, we saw the same Brazil all over again, making mistakes, having problems. So if do if we do have a good game against Uruguay, which is what I believe is going to happen, we're going to come with certain confidence against uh, against Brazil. And again, a, a very ugly game, probably very defensive setup. And this is the one that I see a nil nil draw. This is a game that I see nobody scoring and not letting them do absolutely anything. Alfaro already did this in the Copa America. He shut them down completely, and he he knows the formula. So do it again, Alfaro. I don't expect him to do anything differently that already worked with, with him uh, under Costa Rica. So you're going to show our players that same game, use that video. This is what we need to do against Brazil. This is what you guys didn't do against Brazil in the Copa America. And I believe he's going to have the, the perfect setup. This is the kind of games where I want to see Gustavo Alfaro's experience take over Ralph. But Ralph, yeah. well, this is, is this, you know, just wanted to jump in. This is also the games where you can't afford to drop points at the same time because you're at home. Yes, I understand the rival in Brazil, but you need to win these games. That's the that's the main part of it all, and honestly. But I, I get the whole I get the whole notion. No, no, but I do get the whole notion of trying to get these results just because of the circumstances we're in. I get that. Yeah, this is on paper an easier game than Uruguay away because of how badly Brazil have done. Because remember, Brazil won their first two qualifiers. They look really good. I think they beat Venezuela. Was it like 5-0? Um, or was it or was it Bolivia? Bolivia. It was Bolivia and then Peru. That was and then Peru, right? So you thought, wow, okay, they're fine. They're looking good. But actually, they're playing two of the weaker teams. And since then, they haven't picked up a win in the World Cup qualifiers. So in on paper, it's, it's actually an easier game, which is strange to talk about Brazil that way. The game in Copa America, let's remember as well, Paraguay really fell apart in about five minutes before halftime or it was seven minutes, whatever it was. So even though they did, the, the game plan was wrong because they gave way too much space to Vinicius and, and too much one-on-ones against Velasquez, which just was a mismatch. But they did manage to actually hold out, except for that crazy 
that crazy period. Now with a much more experienced coach and somebody who's just done it before, as they were saying with Costa Rica, you, you kind of feel there's there's going to be a much better setup. And we're not going to see Paraguay's not going to be as open because we were very attacking in that game, if you remember. Um, Alderete scores from outside the box. Imagine, like, that's your central defender. So that gives you an indication. We're going to see a much more defensive game, but I think we we also then are going to see a much tighter match from our side in terms of not being able to go forward as much, therefore not giving them as much space. And so, yeah, the, the nil-nil could be... I don't want to go for another nil-nil, though. But I think we could see another tie. I actually think the game I remember most similar coming into this when Brazil went doing very well, they came to Paraguay. We had a new coach that was very experienced, was Ramon Diaz. We actually went 2-0 up. The game ended 2-2 because of Dani Alves kind of brought them back into it against Iturbe, who, who came on. I kind of feel like a 2-2 draw. And, and I don't know if I was, I was checking this this morning, but it's gone from my head. But I think he drew 2-2 with Ecuador against Brazil as well i have to look that up but i i think we're going to get a tie but a, a slightly high scoring tie in 2-2 you're saying 2-2 i'm, I'm going to look up that prediction real quick uh i'm sorry that um that score line real quick fede but what what says you you say no no on this one or do you want to be more optimistic then I, i'm gonna go with a tight match guys it, it's very hard to keep uh brazil from scoring right and that's why i think rob is saying yeah they're probably gonna score we're gonna have to probably try to fight it and obviously i want to see I want to see an exciting game, so I, 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 I'm supporting Ralph's decision on this one, but I'm going to stick with my idea. I'm going to stick with a very ugly game. We already won in Uruguay the way I see it, so with a nil-nil draw against Brazil, I'm doing my parade on Palma, guys. I'm I'm rooting for, and I'm going to be very happy for with four points. January 2022, 1-1 draw was Ecuador-Brazil. Um ralph so yes it's it's been done before so anyway yeah we, we've seen them snatch results in any sense against the two teams as alfaro was a manager i'm gonna say though i think we're gonna shock the world i think we're gonna i just feel like this brazil side is very vulnerable again a draw would be great but i feel like if you want to be in a position that we feel most comfortable in is getting four points out of eight sorry out of six from this combo the, probably the hardest combo that paraguay has had or will have in this entire process, I think getting the win is is important in this one. And I'm going to say it's going to be one of those ugly games, but ultimately, similar to what Feather said against Uruguay, we get the three points and we get the 1-0 win. I think Enciso is going to have fun with this team, honestly. I think he's going to really feel motivated. And, you know, hopefully they combine well with Gomez and Sosa. If he goes, I I think I genuinely see a 1-0 win in this one. I think in Cecil for kind of all the critics that he's had about his personal life, that he gives a big result and it really stamps his authority as the main star for Paraguay that they haven't had in quite some time. So, yeah, honestly, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a really good game. Two great games, two big ones. I think obviously a lot of debating from this time until next week, essentially next week, because obviously we're recording on a Tuesday. The next game against Brazil, the last game is against um, next Tuesday as well. So, yeah, a lot going on in the next seven days. So I'm looking forward to it. We'll obviously give our coverage as we always do here on Guadalupe Vision after the games. And yeah, let's hope that Paraguay can go into both these two games with the sense of motivation and just a game plan that helps a lot of the Paraguayans feel motivated at this team so they can qualify for the 2026 World Cup as we close out our World Cup qualifier preview episode for myself, Roberto Rojas. Fede Perez and Ralph Hanna, thank you so much for listening in. See you soon.